on this week's episode. It's the first big box office battle of 2021. Amazon hears the roar of the lion, and it's time to be friends once again. All this and more as we reach our next stop, the PCC Multiverse. Don't be alarmed. The quasi-shimmering light before you is a trans-dimensional gateway to other worlds, other voices, other thoughts, and other realities. Up feels like down, and down feels like the number seven on a Wednesday morning. Don't worry. That quivering blood-boiling sensation under your eyebrows is all a part of the charm. Welcome to the PCC Multiverse. And we're back with another episode of the PCC Multiverse. This is Gerald Glassford from Pop Culture Cosmos, Game Source, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and the Lakers Fast Break. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our shows. And if you can, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, or do anything that you can to support us right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos, popculturecosmos.com, or wherever we're at on social media, It is sincerely appreciated. But it wouldn't be a PCC Multiverse without a good friend of mine, and this is one of my longest friends that I've known. It's good for me. Sorry for him. But you got to catch him today whenever he goes and contributes to Pop Culture Cosmos, popculturecosmos.com, and, of course, everything Game Source as well. He is the master of streaming that you can find him at, at Degenerate2018 on Twitch. It is Jamie Monroy, and Jamie, good to have you back here once again. It's great to be back in the pop culture cosmos. Always, man. Always great to have you here. Got a lot of great things lined up here in the future. Hopefully, you'll be a part of that if you wish, because we've got a lot of great ideas that are coming down the pike, so hopefully you'll be a part of that as well. But we've got a great show and a great episode for everyone out there. Cannot thank you for watching and listening wherever it's being streamed or the over 40 radio stations worldwide. We truly appreciate you playing the Pop Culture Cosmos. This week, we're going to be talking about a lot of great things, including the first big box office battle here in the U.S. in a long time. What do we mean by that? That's right. People are going back to the movies this Memorial Day weekend here in the U.S. We'll talk about the two movies vying for number one and what's different between each coming up here on the broadcast. Plus, also as well, we've got... Amazon decided to dole out the cash. How much cash? In in regards to MGM Studios, they bought themselves a lion and a whole lion share of good movies, good television shows and whatnot. So we'll talk about Amazon buying MGM Studios coming up on the program and how that may change the landscape of your streaming viewing coming up here on the show as well. Plus, we've got Sony finding its Craven the Hunter Hmm, you didn't see that one coming on who they picked, so we'll talk about that coming up on the show. Oscar Isaac is officially Moon Knight, something that was absolutely to no surprise to no one out there because the rumors have been verified by reliable sources for quite some time, so we'll talk about that coming up here in the program. And then also, The Outer Worlds we might touch on because it is officially now a Microsoft property. We'll talk about the little bit of a fervor that went on with 2K and Microsoft coming up on the show as well. And then last but not least, on the back end, there were some gameplay trailers that were shown today. Today was a heavy news day. So we had we saw it. That was Horizon Forbidden West and also Dying Light 2 Stay Human. Which of these games showed their gameplay better? I'll have my thoughts and Jamie will have his thoughts as well coming up on the program. But first, my friend, when you know, we'll start off with that word, friend. Because Friends, one of the most popular sitcoms of all time and a staple of the 1990s. I mean, you just cannot do any kind of look back upon the 1990s, the whole decade, without bringing that show up and bringing this, the tremendous amount of success that it had over the course of its many years on the air. But the cast of Friends... After much debate, after much going back and forth, and probably after much HBO Max kind of finally dishing out the cash, backing up the Brinks trunk, as they say, they finally went ahead and got together for reunion. 
and that reunion is coming out on HBO Max this weekend. So I want to hear your thoughts, my friend. After so many years together, they're, they got a chance to sit down. They talked about a lot of things. I think the most interesting thing that was there was the possibility of a real-life romance between David Schwimmer and Jennifer Aniston that uh, unfortunately never came to pass. But I want to hear your thoughts on friends coming back together in this age. I know a lot of people are, are going to be excited for it, but will that do enough to move the needle for HBO Max? Well, I think it'll be enough to bring in some people that maybe not didn't think of HBO Max. I know I could think of one person in particular, my mother. She was a huge fan of Friends and probably knows nothing of HBO Max. But I bet you if I told her this was there, she'd probably look into it, be all over it just because of that. You know, she wants to hear that. Exactly. I just feel sorry for that couch after all these years. Yeah, exactly. And and the Perk Cafe and, and all that. And but all I do yards. think it's going to, you know, roll out a little different of a carpet for maybe an avenue of, like I was saying, maybe people that don't realize that there's something there for them on HBO Max because they just yes. hear the word HBO and go, oh. Well, yeah, there's a lot coming up for them, uh, you know, as far as, what they're planning on and you know just just the fact that they brought everything back they made the central perk cafe and the whole nine yards and they made it all nice and nice and they brought back the couch and they all got a chance to reminisce and it reminds me now of what these streaming giants will be doing to bring back these old staple shows and not necessarily re you know revitalize them or bring them back to do a series or anything like that although we do see that already on quite a bit of occasions but uh, you know, for instance, with Will Smith, you know, they brought everybody back from, you know, that they could for and had them get together and just reminisce about the old times. They're seemingly going down that path in the same way as Friends. Do you think this is going to be a home run for HBO Max? I mean, at this point in time, with the purchase of or actually the merger with Discovery and the future that lies there, the things are looking up for HBO Max. Agreed. Things are looking very up, and I, I can't say this is a bad way to go. The, I enjoyed the Fresh Prince reunion was great. You know, obviously it didn't have everybody there that everybody would have liked to have there. Yeah, but it was everybody that they could. Yeah. With the Friends one, it's a t- different avenue. I, I don't see. I see Fresh Prince being more of a broader avenue than Friends is, and I see that because I see it more as a niche. Friends to me is a niche market. I and disagree I with that. you there. I, I'm not a fan of the show, but I'm, I, I. I respect the millions and millions. Of, I know the numbers for that Agreed. they had. Agreed. The and numbers the fact can't is, lie. And, and the fact that you know, I know what Friends does in reruns, even to this day. Yeah. Uh, on on streaming giants, and I know how vital it is as a backbone. I mean, we talked about before on the show, and you and I have on this show mm-hmm. as well about how the office is such a huge component for streaming giants, Netflix in the past, same thing with friends and what it brings. NCIS is now seeing that same popularity on streaming giants right now. And as far as Netflix is concerned, that's their backbone. Yes. They love throwing out the new movies and television shows and same thing with HBO max, but it's those staple sitcoms that people know and love. That's what the backbone of, of, people why that's one of the yeah. major reasons why people check these streaming giants out true that's absolutely true because there's always a different show with connected with a different streaming service that kind of grabs you yeah. so that makes that makes perfect sense i, uh, I don't think it was that. a niche i don't think niche is uh, like niche was the I wrong not, word okay niche is the niche wrong was word the very wrong word friends was i mean it reached the pinnacle of what that you want to do with television. it just yeah. it wasn't everybody's cup of tea no, it wasn't, mine. And it, wasn't it wasn't mine either. But again, it's one of the most successful shows of that and era. And I can't I mean, argue you... that because even merchandise, yeah, it's still yeah. to this day. Exactly. And so insane. many people, millions and millions of people have so much fondness for that television series. And this, I guess, reunion, for lack of a better term, this reunion of the Friends, even if it's only just ends up being an hour or two hour special, it's going to be something that's going to draw in audiences, at least in the short term, whether or not they can do anything with that. That's the thing. And that's the final question I have for you on this is that can HBO Max do something with this and take this momentum 
maybe you know get some of the friends back together for for a short series or something that I know that's probably a want by the large fan base that's out there, but do you think HBO Max can do something other than just say, okay, we have the reunion, did a few million viewers, and then we called a day? I think they could do something realistically because if you look at some of the upcoming lineup, you know, look at I know there's a little show called uh, CSI Vegas. Yeah. I mean, that's coming back to television back, on CBS. Yeah. What is it, three or four of the staple characters from the original yes. are coming I back for this? Three are coming back on a regular basis. I think a fourth is coming on a limited time. In and out? Yeah. That's what I thought, too. But, I mean, look at that. That, to me, right there, another show that is a staple of its time. Yeah. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of that one. But Yeah, well, that was once the most popular show on planet Earth as well. So can it do it again? And yeah. I think they're going to attempt that, obviously, because the characters that are going to be there on a consistent are – a lot of the characters that are what push that there. And plus you see CBS. Well, you see CBS has now, in fact, this is CBS and NBC. NBC has a Chicago night. And then you have CBS that now has its FBI night and its NCIS programs running. That's something that they want to do is group a night of television. So if CSI Vegas does become successful, once again, you can start building shows around it and creating its own CSI night like you once had, because they did have Miami and they did have uh, another CSI. They had CSI Cyber and CSI New York. And they had yeah. other CSI shows as well. So so I, it's just something that they could, if they see that kind of success again, you're right. But when it comes to Friends, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that they're going to be sure? able to entice any of the individuals to come back and, and create a new spinoff show or something like that. I know that that HBO max would try and try hard, especially if this reunion special does get the kind of numbers that they're looking for, but I'm kind of weary that they will go ahead. It's not like you can throw a ton of money at them because of the fact they get so much in residuals, I'm assuming, and I'm, I'm assuming when I say this bit, but because of the fact friends is still one of the most watched shows on television, whether it's streaming or still in syndication around the world, that they are still seeing a nice chunk of change from the show. And because of that, I still think that it's going to be hard to get them back together, even though none of them right now outside of Jennifer Aniston are having any real kind of success in the movies or television right now. I would say it's in their best interest to get back together if they want to go ahead professionally, but monetarily it that wouldn't be the reason because they're making still I'm, I'm assuming again quite a bit of money yeah i would assume that is definitely the case i would assume that as well but you don't know you don't think maybe just a small limited series maybe even just a small movie a friend's movie that's that could be possible because sex in the city is coming back in a limited series and i, I know they just talked about getting together and every, all the major characters outside of kim control has agreed to going ahead and coming back together for the series. Uh, I know that got, that got a lot of people excited. So we'll see what happens there with that. that and of course, that's going to be coming back to HBO Max because that was such a staple of HBO. But, I, I, you know, if they're going to do anything with Friends, if they're going to do it with anything with the Friends concept beyond this, I, I would be surprised just because of the fact that all those individuals coming back, I think this is going to be a one-off. And unfortunately, I think that people are just going to have to savor this as best they can, because I don't think they're going to get much more. What are your thoughts out there on the Friends reunion? The 90s are coming back in style with one of the major staples from that decade. The whole cast of Friends is reunited for a special on HBO Max. Are you excited to see this? Were you a big fan of the show? And do you think anything, anything at all, can come up this maybe for the future down the road for HBO and HBO Max. Please let us know. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Something could be percolating. Uh Uh-huh. Central Perk Coffee. Something could be percolating indeed. Hey, this is Chad from Ghost Toasters, and you're listening to Pop Culture Cosmos Podcast. If you want to see the coolest action figure collections out there, the stuff that you played with as a kid, hear from industry insiders that made the toys that really, truly defined who we are, and you got to check out season one of Action Figure Adventure. Check out Action Figure Adventure now, exclusively at Big Bad Toy Store. You'll get 10 episodes of awesome action figure fun. 
I guarantee if you grew up playing toys, you will love action figure adventure. Tell you what, my friend, there's still much more to talk about on this week's show. Something is always percolating here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. I want to tell you right now, everybody, that it is Memorial Day weekend. And first off, everybody have a safe and happy Memorial Day weekend out there. Hope you enjoy it as best as possible. But number two is there's a big battle going on for the first time in a long time, in well over a year. We now have a big battle in place. First off, I'm going to mention A Quiet Place Part 2 because that was actually already done, just about ready to go ahead and debut in theaters when it got yanked in right in the middle of everybody being locked down, everybody just starting to be you know, pulled out, everything was starting to go awry in the world. And actually they were doing John Krasinski – and he was actually already doing promotional work and interviews for that at the time that they had pulled it. And it's now been over a year, and it's now going to finally debut in theaters at the same time, conveniently, with Cruella, which is going to be a day and date with Disney, uh, with Disney+. Plus. So you can buy it as a premium. I think it's $30. You can stay mm-hmm. at home and watch it. Or you could go out and check it out at the movie theaters. Or you're going to be checking out A Quiet Place Part 2. So I want to hear your thoughts on this, my friend, because it is the first big box office battle in a long time. Now, we know around the world right now, everybody's going F9 because in a lot of places around the world, F9 has already debuted or is debuting, and it's going to wreak havoc on the international box office, and it did $160 million already last weekend. So we know that's there. But here domestically in the U.S., it is a battle for the first time in a long time since the start of the pandemic between two high profile movies. So I want to hear your thoughts on who will come out on top and if it's going to be a win-win situation for everyone involved. Ooh, a win-win. That's a rough one, but mm-hmm. all right. So first big battle in a long time, well over a year, as you said, yeah, honestly, my horse was on F9, but that's internationally. So you know, yeah. I mean, right we will now. not see it here <laughs> until just to give everybody an yeah. idea, the U S and the UK will not see it until Late June, around the 25th, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. We're going to be behind for months. Yes. <laughs> but I digress. I don't, is it going to be a really fair fight considering one gets a, you know, premium Disney? Well, you, one one you can get see that it advantage. All. And with A Quiet Place Part 2, but it was going to be a day and date, and there was a heavily rumored on that, but I think it is just going to be a widely distributed film. So I want to hear your thoughts, right. my friend. Is there a disadvantage for Cruella that you can also see it at home? I don't know if it's a disadvantage for Cruella or a disadvantage for A Quiet Place that it'll draw less numbers because people will just take the advantage of being able to see it at home because they're so used to that now. Yeah. You know, it's just been what everyone's been doing for the most part. So to say it's a fair fight, I don't know if that's a fair fight. Is that a little bit of a disadvantage or an advantage? To you know, on both aspects, I don't know, because to me, if if one has a difference than the other, then it's already not fair. But if you're going to a theater and you're going to say and you're looking at it and you have that's your choices right there, you go, hmm, I got Cruella, I got a Quiet Place too. Honestly, if it was me, I'm going with something new. I'm not going to go with the sequel. I'm going to go with Cruella. So you're going to go with Cruella. Is that correct? I would if I was stand if it now if this is me standing at the movie theater box office, I'm taking home out of it. Okay. This is because obviously if this is a fight of two after this long, I want to go to the movie theater. So okay. I'm standing at the box office. I'm I'm looking. I'm going to go Corella only because to me that's a fresh movie. It's a fresh, not a fresh take on something, but it is a fresh take on something. Whereas the other one's a sequel. So. I, personally, I could wait for the sequel to see it. I might go back to the movies to see it. But Cruella would probably be the one to draw me in enough to go, okay, let's let's see if this is going to be the one to take it. Just to let everybody know, again, we can want to confirm that a, a Quiet Place Part 2 is going to debut first in theaters. But after, a, I believe, a 30 to 45-day window, it will be debuting on Paramount+. Plus. So Paramount+, Plus has got this. I know there was some debate on whether or not it's going to be day and date. And I know that there was some blowback or brushback from the actors themselves because of the contract issues. The same thing that I know or was rumored to be as far as with Scarlett Johansson with 
Black Widow as well, as far as because the actor is assuming it's going to go out in theaters, get that kind of money. But then again, if it goes straight to home, then there might be out a lot of money. So there has to be a lot of negotiation and fine tuning there. So it is going to be in theaters for a limited amount of time here in the U.S. before it hits Paramount Plus, which will be a big win for them because Paramount Plus is starting to go ahead and build a library and starting to get things going and whether or not it can catch up to the other streaming services, that's still to be debated. And that's a, another issue for another day. But when it comes to A Quiet Place Part 2, like you said, it is a sequel to a very much beloved, a, a surprisingly very well-received original hit. But do you see it as just more of the same? Do you see it as far as being able to rekindle that magic? Or I already have a feeling you're going to say this, but I have a feeling you're talking about treading down the same waters which is why it's not as appealing as, let's say, Cruella, which brings a fresh take to a very intriguing character in the Disney library. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. That's what I was trying to say a minute ago. But yeah, I think it is going to be a lot of treading the same line, going down the same waters. Whereas you were saying Cruella is a fresh take on a beloved, well, not maybe not beloved, but <laughs> a character that is well-known and established to where now we get, it's kind of like Maleficent where it kind of yeah. took you more in depth of, okay, let's focus on this character. not And that's why the first movie. one did so well, but then again, they did a sequel and then it went all downhill from there. Right. So if Cruella does well and they decide to go ahead and make a sequel, make sure they take note of the kind of things that they should have learned from the Maleficent sequel. That's, that's all I say. We can hope. We can hope. Yes, we can hope. But I really think that's where that's going is a fresh take on that character. And I I think it'll do well. I really do because Maleficent, again, it seems to do well. It's when they try and go for more that (laughs) they kind of miss the brass ring. Exactly. Exactly. I I couldn't agree with you more on that. I I think Cruella will do well. How Mm -hmm. well, we're not sure because the last attempt at a premium access for Disney Plus with Raya and The Last Dragon, even though that was a well-received movie, and I think it's very good, was still not watched i think to the level of disney satisfaction so i think that was a miss for them on that they should i think made it free like they did soul and i think that would have garnered a much better response i think would probably be the best way to say it but again this is going to be something that they're going to try and push again the same thing in july with black widow they're going to try and do that and see what comes out of it but i am saying this is going to be a very tightly contested race because the fact simply be even though it's a horror movie, it's still going to earn decent numbers. And I think it's going to be decent enough. And there's also going to be enough people staying home that won't be going out, that don't need to go out to go see the gorilla because they can see it at home. That's going to make it a very tight race between the two. I think for me, it's too close to call and it could go either way. Hmm. True, true. I guess we'll have to see when the dust settles. Absolutely. And we'll give you a report on that on Monday's show to let you know exactly how well each is trending over the course of the Memorial Day weekend. So hopefully you'll join us for that. But it is Cruella versus A Quiet Place Part 2. I'm very happy to announce that finally we have a box office battle once again. It fills my heart with joy that I'm able to go ahead and say those words. I really just look forward to every weekend to go ahead and tell you and update you. If you hear my old episodes of the show on on what was going on, that was one of my big joys of getting everybody updated on what was going on in the box office, not only domestically, but internationally. It was just great to throw out those numbers to everyone to get them up to speed on what is doing well and what's not. So hopefully we can give you that gauge once again and really looking forward to it. So hopefully you'll be able to hear that on the Monday show. Who do you think will win this weekend at the box office? Which are you going to see? Or are you going to see both? Which would be really cool that you're seeing a family-oriented movie and a not-so-family-oriented movie. Right. Corella is just not family-oriented at all. Oh, well, that's, yeah. Well, maybe I didn't have that in mind. But (laughs) Corella versus A Quiet Place Part 2. We want to hear your thoughts on who might win this battle this Memorial Day weekend here in the U.S. Please share us your thoughts. Pop culture cosmos at yahoo.com. Well, before we hit the half hour break and we go into detail on Amazon buying MGM Studios, I want to hear your quick thoughts. I'm going to give you a big rundown on these first off. Sony is finding its Craven the Hunter, my friend. And I want to hear your thoughts on this. Aaron Taylor Johnson, you didn't see this coming. 
because he was in the Marvel Cinematic Universe already as Quicksilver. Unfortunately, he didn't get a call back for WandaVision. But your thoughts real quick on Aaron Taylor Johnson getting the call as Craven the Hunter. I'm not exactly in love with it. It's a kind of situation where you're going to have to show me, prove it to me that he's going to be able to play the role effectively, even though I really know he's a good actor. And by the way, if we could ever see a kick-ass three, that would be awesome. But I want to hear your thoughts on Aaron Taylor Johnson instead of coming back to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And this is still loosely connected to the MCU. As Quicksilver, he is now part of the Spider-Verse as Kraven the Hunter. I'm, oh man, I'm with you on that. I think it has to be proven. I'm not picturing it myself. I think I'm holding on to too much Quicksilver. And I'm not picturing it in my own head. I just, well, I'm yeah, trying you know, to see Craven they, they there. Like to do this. They like to do this with Gemma Chan in The Eternals. And that's something I know I'm going to touch on more. And I'll, I'll probably hear your thoughts on this on the way out on The Eternals trailer. But I'm going to touch on this in detail on the Monday show. I'm not going to cover it in detail and share my thoughts on it. But if you want to, before we head on out, you can do so. But Gemma Chan was in Captain Marvel. And now she's playing a character in The Eternals. So this is not something like it's it's unknown territory. And the Spider-Verse is loosely related to the MCU, but I can't see it either, my friend. I mean, there's been names top, you know, that were tossed around. In fact, there were rumors of actors like Keanu Reeves being talked about for Craven the Hunter. I know a lot of people were dropping a lot of memes on getting Carl Urban that role because of his tremendous work with the boys. I thought he, I think he would be sensational as Craven the Hunter, personally. But your thoughts on this whole thing? I mean, the reason why we we're making such a big deal is that Craven the Hunter is expected to get his own standalone movie before it ever comes to a Sinister Six or anything like that, whether he works against or with Spider-Man, most likely against. But we're talking about him getting his own standalone movie. And not to say he can't power his own standalone movie, I just didn't, I, I cannot still picture him being a 100% effective Craven the Hunter. No, I think you're right. I don't know if he's got the standalone power. Not not yet. Not yet. I think if they maybe would have thrown in somewhere in with the whole, you know, Carnage thing, maybe a cameo there or just more substance before you just kind of quickly threw it together. He might get a cameo in one of the upcoming movies. Not necessarily. But is that going to be enough to yeah. throw into the standalone? I I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's very concerning. I mean, if that's the case, you need that kind of drawing power. And obviously, with Tom Hardy, he had a big enough name to drive the Venom movie forward enough to a big hit. And at one time, it was the most popular R-rated movie of all time before Joker supplanted it. And a lot of people were loving that, and they're going to be excited for Venom 2. And then we see Jared Leto, who is such a sensational actor and has a line of great performances to his G, and also, I believe, an Academy Award nomination or so. Mm -hmm. And he is got that power when he goes and leads Morbius, although that's in January, so I don't think the pressure's really on in a movie in January. We've talked about January movies already on the show before, and they're either sent to die there or they're sent to not give that much pressure put on them because it's January and there's less movie crowds. So really, I mean, if it performs well, it, it'll exceed everybody's expectations. So I don't think a whole lot of pressure is on that. But Craven the Hunter getting his own movie, I expected another, I expected a bigger name actor to go ahead and be in that role. And again, it's going to be have to be a prove it to me type deal. Let's finish this conversation with some final thoughts. I mean, if you had one actor to fill that role of Craven Hunter, I mentioned Carl Urban, but there's that one actor that you could have had to fill that role. I know Keanu Reeves wouldn't have been so bad. Brad Pitt was also heavily rumored to be involved. I, mean, I could picture John Wick in there yeah. going, you know, oh, ah, Spider-Man, I smell you. you know, but I don't know. I don't know. I grew up with the animation and the comic books, and I'm just not seeing that. I'm not feeling that when I hear who's going to helm that character right now. Well, it all depends on the accent. If the accent is going to be Craven, going to be an Eastern European, then obviously that fits for Aaron Taylor Johnson because of what he's already done with Quicksilver and the Sokovian accent, even though Sokovia is not a real country. 
if they're basing, I, I would just love it. Carl Urban playing, you know, using his original voice, the, the voice that he uses in the boys, his, his actual okay. accent, Australian accent. I think that would be just the best way to do it. But then again, that's me, you, you know, changing origin stories or changing things around. Doesn't really matter that much in the MCU because they'll do it anyways. So I don't know. That's our thoughts on it. I mean, if you have thoughts on Aaron Taylor Johnson, most well known for being Quicksilver in the MCU that wasn't brought back, and also as well the guy behind Kickass as Kickass, we want to hear your thoughts on if you like or approve him becoming the new Craven the Hunter in Sony's Spider Verse. Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. We'll be talking a major acquisition by Amazon. We'll also be talking some major gameplay reveals. And also, we will be talking about Oscar Knight finally saying yes to Moon Knight. We'll talk about that and more, including some Outer Worlds, coming up right after the break. This is the PCT Multiverse. You've heard others, but nothing could prepare you for the shameful stupidity that is the Jock and Nerd Podcast. Here, Imran. So if you offend everyone at once, it all it's a wash. I've covered everybody. Anthony. Sorry, I was texting. Say that again. And Rug Boy. Yeah, whenever there's a snowstorm, my slack hole tightens up. As they talk over one another. Just exactly uh, the same as, as, as Terminator. Terminator. We're talking over each other. It's fine. Sorry. Swear and ask you for money. Just give us the money. Witness the hubris as they claim to be the world's authority on comic book movies. Who said that? Never said that. You've never said that. Who cares? A jock said that. Comic book, TV, movie reviews, news, and whatever they choose. Available on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Jock and Nerd Podcast. It can't be silly, goofy fun. Seriously, people really listen to this. Uh. Jock and Nerd! And we're back with the show. It's the PCC Multiverse, along with my good friend, my longtime good friend. I've known him more than i know Josh or Marcus. It is my good friend, Mr. Jamie Monroy. I'm sorry, by the way, we were discussing numbers yesterday and whew, I felt bad for you. I was like, wow, really? Yes, exactly. We were talking about how many times we've been to E3 because we had to go ahead and fill out some forms for E3 media. And yeah, how many years I've been to E3? And I was like, oh, I can't remember the numbers. And like, once I started typing out, I'm like, oh gosh, I'm old. But, and I started remembering, oh yeah, well, you went by yourself with them and I went by myself with them. And then, oh, Yeah, man. exactly. Oh, yes. Good times though. Good memories. Uh, I always enjoyed my time at E3 and hopefully we will get the opportunity to do so again. But Back to this week's program, my friend, and a major acquisition by Amazon Studios acquiring MGM Studios for eight plus billion. That's right. Eight plus billion dollars. I get you the exact, I think it's 8.46, but I'm going to get you the exact number. 8.46. Yeah, 8.46 right. billion. I don't know how they could come up with that 0.46. Just make it a flat, even number. Makes some more sense to me. Let's just round it off 8.5. Let's call it a day. But I want to hear your thoughts on this. I know there was a possibly a holdup, according to rumors. And I really don't like going down Rumorville very much, unlike Josh. Josh loves taking the trip down to Rumorville. I will actually also will have a correction coming up here in a second. And also a pat on the back for Josh before we head on out. But I want to hear your thoughts on this with Amazon and MGM. Where do you lie on this? I mean, to me, it's a big, big yes. And this is something that I've been arguing that Amazon has needed to do for a long time. Since 2016, since I started this show, I said that Amazon Prime needs to get its act together. They've got a gazillion dollars from all the memberships that you and I have for Amazon Prime. They've got this little Prime video thing that you use as almost like a Chia Pet, just growing there and doing not much of anything. But you finally built it up over the years. You finally started to take it seriously in the past two years. You acquired movies like the Coming to America sequel, like the Borat sequel. These are movies you needed to do and have done extremely well on it. In fact, Borat 2 has some like supplemental stuff, VHS, that's going to debut very soon, if it not already. I so you want to check did. that out. Just did? Okay, on mm -hmm. Amazon Prime, so please check that out. It's always a good laugh for me. But I want to go ahead and hear your thoughts on this. I think this is really, really a big move for them. Do I put it on the par of Star Wars and Marvel going to Disney? I'm actually going to say yes. Nice, nice. I like that. I I couldn't agree with you more. I was just telling um, the family, actually, because I was actually on 
my phone when the news broke. And I said, wow, I, I couldn't agree with you. I said the exact same thing. I said, this is something they've needed to do for a while. Yeah. They're very limited as far as their library. You know, it's either you top can rent end, it by it. Top end library. Top end, right. You know, a lot of their own stuff, great. Invincible. You know, you mentioned it for yourself, the boys. The boys. This is all great stuff that they're doing, but there's so much more. Because you've got all these other hitters coming in now. You've got Paramount Plus, who's got access to Nickelodeon stuff, CBS stuff. Comedy you've got, Central. Yeah, I mean, all these have, places are just... And then you have Peacock, which just bought WWE Network for rights for them for five years, $1 billion. Plus, they've gotten a ton of stuff heading over there. Then you've got HBO Max and Discovery getting together, and nice, nice, and merging there, so... It's either going to be one way as far as getting a ton of stuff, Discovery Way to HBO Max or vice versa. We could possibly see that. So that's thousands and thousands of hours right there for you for those streaming outlets. And these are all new streaming outlets compared to Amazon. Yes. And with Amazon, I mean, we talked about the Lord of the Rings here on the show in the past weeks, how they spent a billion dollars, 500 getting the rights and 500 million actually in the first season of Amazon's Lord of the Rings series, the prequel and whatnot. So I'm really excited to see that. They're dishing out, finally, a lot of cash that they needed to go ahead and do. It's not just the James Bond library. And I know that's the big ticket everybody's looking at. Is And I know that was the holdup as far as how it's going to be distributed. And, yes, the James Bond movie that's going to appear later this year, still scheduled to as of this time, is still going to appear first in theaters. It's going to be a worldwide release. I know a lot of people were questioning that first off. Just want, I think it's No Time to Die, if memory serves. No Time to Die, that will be debuting later this year in theaters. I don't think it'll be day and date. I think it's debuting worldwide theaters first, unless it changes, but we'll let you know here. I know that James Bond Library is the crown jewel of this all, but there are 4,000 movies and 17,000 shows, television shows, that they have under their belts at MGM Studios, especially a lot of uh, legendary stuff. I think from Mary Tyler Moore, that whole de- deal down there, as far as the, uh, Rhoda, I think those shows were under the MGM banner and, and a ton of movies as well. Like I said, 4,000 and 17,000 shows, 4,000 movies. That's a ton of hours. That's a ton of programming that you're now putting on to your platform. What do you think that's going to do for Amazon Prime? Because again, they also have the unique advantage with all the other services they have. And as you, as a Twitch streamer, the best Twitch streamer, we're we're right behind you at Pop Culture Cosmos, but the best Twitch streamer out there. I'm scared. Exactly. I'm nervous. As well, you should be. But, you know, in fact, we're on Twitch right now. Hello, Twitch. But I wanted to say this, you know, with Amazon, their affiliation there, but you got all the other stuff with the, you know, the clouds, all the stuff. Hey, you have Amazon Luna. Yeah, exactly. All the stuff that they do in regards to Amazon Prime and, of course, the shipping, which is the primary deal for most everybody out there. Sorry for the pun on the primary. But I wanted to ask you this, my friend. What does this do to drive? Because they already have a 200 million subscriber base, very similar in numbers to Netflix. Could this drive the numbers even higher? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because right now the subscriber base is based off of what they've already had and existing things. And obviously, you know, Prime. Now you're opening a door to a floodgate of things that people may have not even thought twice about for your platform. Because right now everybody's going, oh, Paramount Plus has all of this. And oh, HBO Max is getting all of this. And they already have this. Amazon, to me, was getting not left behind, but they were getting stuck. Mm-hmm. They were kind of in that rut of, okay, yeah, we get the new stuff too, but kind of we don't have everything because we have to send you somewhere else. You know, you might look it up and it'll be options to watch and it might tell you three different apps you can watch it on or you have to pay for it through them. Mm-hmm. I think that that is where this is all going to change because when that library hits and starts to hit, it's going to – I know myself, I've gone sitting through Amazon Prime on there going through TV shows or documentaries going – well, I've already watched some like this, you know, because they'll be similar, about five different similar ones. They're not all called the same thing, but you can tell they're pretty much similar topic. And this is going to make that to where you're not running into the, OK, what do I watch now? And I think it might draw some people back from those apps that they've gotten hooked into as far as Paramount Plus and HBO Max, maybe draw them back into Amazon's programming 
because they'll go, ooh, fresh stuff, and it's it's stuff they're familiar with, like you were saying. Yes, you do have the James Bond library at your leisure now with Amazon, and of course that's going to be heavily promoted, but it's all the other legacy shows that they have with the MGM label on it that's almost as great interest me because I'm a huge James Bond fan. You've already hooked me on that. It's all those other shows, 17,000 television shows and 4,000 movies, which they love to blast it out on those PR notes in regards to the sale. That's a lot right there for you. The 4,000 may not stick out as much, but that 17,000 shows sticks out to me because that's not counting out the episodes and that's not counting out the total number of hours you can consume on it. So People have got to go ahead and understand how much this changes the dynamic, in my opinion, as much as the Discovery HBO Max merger, if it's done right. Now, the Discovery HBO Max merger, and after that, they're just kept apart. It really doesn't do anything. They've got to go ahead and be combined, and a person coming to buy a subscription has all that access to all that stuff. The same thing with Amazon, and Amazon's not going to separate an MGM channel or anything like that. They're going to combine it, loop it all into Amazon Prime. I think that's the way to do it, and I think that's what's going to help stick them out and possibly even give them an advantage over Netflix going forward. I think you're right. It's time for Netflix to step up. Everyone else is putting out their, you know, A games. Well, they're only spending $19 billion this year at content on Netflix. So, you know, trouble them, trouble them. But it's going to be very, very interesting to see how this lays out. I mean, this is something about two, three years ago, it was starting to get a little warmer and get a little warmer, the stream wars and things of that nature. But did we know it would explode like this so soon? I think the pandemic and people staying home and watching a lot of streaming helped facilitate this. And now coming kind of out of the pandemic we're not out of it yet and i know that so please stay safe everyone hopefully everyone is well and stays that way so coming out of it i'm starting to see this reliance even though we're out more and doing more things there's still going to be reliance on streaming services to be our entertainment going forward and i think that they understand that finally that they see the rewards and the benefits of these streaming services so i'm looking forward to it the the wars are heating up my friend i'm enjoying it my wallet isn't, but I'm sure as heck enjoying it, and I know you are too. I couldn't agree more. My wallet isn't, but I am. And I remember we had a small conversation about this when Disney Plus was the new kid on the block. Yes. I think when we were talking about Disney Plus and we were saying how that was going to affect Netflix, I don't think anybody saw the big picture of all these other names jumping on this ship and going, let's do it. If they can do it, we can do it. I'm looking forward to it, my friend. It's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out, but it is Amazon buying the MGM Studios pending approval. And we've got to make sure everybody knows out there it has to be pending approval. So if it's, uh, you know, the U.S. government says eh, 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 and puts the kibosh on it, you know, that could be an issue right there. But right now, all appearances look like Amazon will be allowed to buy MGM Studios, which is a big win for Amazon and Amazon Prime viewers. What are your thoughts out there on Amazon buying up MGM Studios? The Lions now roaring with Jeff Bezos. Share us your thoughts. Hopefully not eating Jeff Bezos because that wouldn't be good. But share us your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. I feel like I should be holding an Amazon package on Pride Rock. Exactly. Thanks for checking out the PCC. You know, the Pop Culture Cosmos. We'll be back in one moment. If you need your video game fix, be sure to check out Retro City Games. Located in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada, Retro City Games has the cure for all your video game vices. Retro games and games for current consoles, Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation, Xbox, and more. Retro City Games has all the staples from any library and some highly collectible offerings too. So pick up a few games today at Retro City Games in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada. Retro City Games is your video game metropolis but my friend there's still much more to talk about on today's program one little quick note i want to go ahead and mention on the monday show that biomutant which just came out to consoles and pc this week actually is not what josh said Uh, unfortunately he, he made a correction he sent it to me after we'd already sent it to post and sent it out to our stations it is not on xbox games pass yet 
the mediocre reviews and any type of response to it will probably necessitate or warrant it going on Xbox. It's actually Game under Pass. EA Pro Play right now. Yeah, it's under EA Pro Play. So it is not yet on Xbox Games Pass. So we do apologize for the confusion on that. So if you're looking for it, we do apologize on that. It will probably, most likely, at some point, come to Xbox Games Pass. But Josh actually will provide a review for it. He was just given a code, so hopefully he will provide thoughts on it in the coming weeks for Biomutant. So he'll tell you really or not if it's eh or if it's good or if it's I can't wait to hear that because I've heard some interesting things so far myself. Yes, I've seen it all over the place. So we'll see what happens as Josh gets a chance to play Biomutant. But his trip down to the Rumorville was correct. And that Sony is developing a Final Fantasy exclusive game. So that's going to be something that is probably going to be officially announced at E3. But Bloomberg kind of backed up what Josh said this week in regards to that as far as a Final Fantasy game coming exclusively to PS5. So looking forward to that and obviously want to thank Josh. This trip down to Rumorville worked out for that time. So hopefully his future trips will work out as well. But my friend, there's still much more to talk about on today's program before we head on out. Speaking of games, I'm going to touch on this before Oscar Isaac is concerned. The Outer Worlds. 2K recently had one of its quarterly meetings and announced how well The Outer Worlds, which is a really good game, really well-received game that came out in late 2019, has done. It sold about 3 million copies, and they still got a little bit more DLC that they're going to add before they go ahead and wrap up shop. At that time, the CEO of 2K had said that there would be future iterations being published by 2K. Microsoft, who bought Obsidian right around the time The Outer Worlds was released, has said the next day, eh, 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 sorry. Unfortunately, the future iterations of The Outer Worlds is going to be published on Microsoft. So your thoughts on this? Do you think it's a win-win move for Xbox owners? Because if that's the case and Obsidian is going to produce any kind of games, I think they're doing Avowed, which is a completely different game Mm -hmm. from The Outer Worlds. Do you think it was successful enough to produce a sequel? In fact, the sequel hasn't even been announced yet. Money says that an Xbox-owned Obsidian studio will be producing only Xbox-exclusive games. Xbox pulled this move with Bethesda. I mean, when they acquired Bethesda, their biggest thing was we're going to bolster the Xbox library. That was what they bolstered. We're going to bolster the Xbox library. This is why we acquired Bethesda, so that we could hit you with those new exclusives right here at Xbox. So I feel like that's going to be the same move that they're going to do with Obsidian, and especially if there is Outer Worlds 2 or whatever it ends up being called. Or I, I feel like that's going to be the same thing. They're going to be like, oh, right here first xbox has it so is it the right move bolstering something though like outer worlds that i'm not sure that i think might be the one where there's a lot of people going okay do you think there should be a sequel personally no no really i don't why so do you didn't have a good time with it or you didn't see it as appealing because three million like... three millions on the fence for me three millions as far as a triple a production was... Three million sold is in over a year is kind of on the fence. I don't think it met the hype for me, mm-hmm. personally. It just didn't meet the hype that I thought was behind it. And it just didn't do it for me. Well, there you go. Uh, I know that a lot of people did enjoy it. Uh, Absolutely. Fallout in space, it's been compared to. And it does have that feel. It does have that look very much so. And Obsidian, who did actually make Fallout New Vegas, one of the best-received Fallout games... Really the only one I spent any real length of time with. I played two other Fallouts and not I mean, I've been all right. It's been, you know, it's a, I'm not a big fan of the Fallout series, but Fallout New Vegas, I think it to me is one of the best of them. So we will see what happens with Obsidian. They could, you never know. They could go back to the Fallout series because they're all under one banner now under Microsoft. So those possibilities are there, but I think that they will eventually go to an Outer Worlds 2. I don't think it's a rush because, again, 3 million sold in over years is an okay number. It's not a great number. But I think at some point that they will delve into it because there's enough favorable response for it. And I look forward to seeing what that could evolve into, if that's going to be something a lot of people are going to be interested in whenever it comes out from Xbox. We'll see about that DLC that's getting ready to release too on the Switch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know that there was a murder mystery DLC that they just dropped a little while ago that 
has been getting favorable reviews and a lot of people like that aspect of it. So that's we'll the one that's getting that. ready to release on the switch. So let's see how it does over there. Yes, absolutely. Indeed. But what are your thoughts out there on the outer worlds? Would you like to see a sequel? And are you happy? It's going to be most likely an Xbox exclusive. If it does come out, share us your thoughts. Pop culture cosmos at yahoo.com. Well, my friend, it's been so great having you here, but before we hand on out a couple last things, Oscar Isaac, the guy from the last round of Star Wars movies, a very accomplished actor Oscar Isaac is, he officially announced on Twitter today that he is officially Moon Knight, which surprised absolutely nobody because the fact that Variety Horori confirmed this back in October. It's just that he didn't want to say it, and Marvel didn't want to say it officially, but Marvel and Oscar Isaac officially said today that he will be heading up the Moon Knight series going forward in Disney Plus, I believe sometime late next year, I think is the projected air date. Like you said, it was nothing that nobody already didn't know. Broke in October. I believe it was even said by Sebastian Stan during a Disney Plus virtual press conference. So it was already said there as well. (laughs) I mean, nothing surprising, exciting. I like the way the Twitter post went. Mysterious, the whole eyes kind of cut right here with all the comic book windows in the background. It was nice. I like Moon Knight's character in mind that I've liked. So I'm kind of anxious to see where this goes, even though we already kind of knew this breaking news. It's good to now see it finally in place that Oscar Isaac is officially Moon Knight. And going forward, I'm looking forward to seeing what he has to offer, not only in just the series, but going forward, he's going to probably play a nice role in the MCU as well. What are your thoughts out there on Oscar Isaac being the next Moon Knight? Please share us your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Ooh, I forgot. One last thought on that. Not his first rodeo as an Egyptian-based character for Marvel either. And who would that be? apocalypse yes that's true absolutely hopefully this will turn out a lot better we won't go with x-men i'm hoping so yes that's why it's in the marvel legacy section go find it there and (laughs) if you watch it it's a time killer but that's about the best i can say he's right but before we get on out my friend one last thing i wanted to go ahead and hear your thoughts horizon forbidden west which is the sequel to horizon zero dawn by sony and playstation And also as well, Dying Light 2, which now has a sub-name, per se. Dying Light 2, Stay Human. Mm -hmm. And hopefully Staying Human is the deal in a zombie game like that. So I want to hear your thoughts. Both debuted major gameplay trailers today, and they gave an extensive look at each, with Dying Light 2 having not only the parkour and the first-person action that we've come to know, but also a choice system and kind of like a Mass Effect system where you make the decisions on which path you will lead, which group you will go with, which organization that you're going to be a part of, or the decisions that you make to help or hurt others. And then you have for Horizon Forbidden West, which is a lot of the same that what we've come to know and appreciate from a very well-received game in that universe with the mechanical dinosaurs and all that. So I want to hear your thoughts to you after you got a chance to look at both What are your thoughts on each? Let's see. We got 14 minutes of Horizon, and I think it was roughly about seven minutes of... Yeah, uh, roughly about Dying Light 2. Dying Light 2, yeah. So in 14 minutes, I was shown that there was a few new little gadgets. You know, we got the slingshot that can kind of goo them stuck for a second, kind of slow them down. Very Uncharted 4 feel for me. Yeah, yeah. And... I think they added more with the, you know, oh, giant mastodons. And, you know, look at this. It's just on a big, massive scale. They were kind of over-accentuating that for me. I loved Horizon. But this, like you said, was a, it seemed a lot a lot of the same. Polished, of course. Then I look at Dying Light 2, and I go, this was more adrenaline-based for me, obviously, with the parkour, everything else. So putting the two together, I'm... I'm leaning more towards Dying Light 2 because right now zombies are hot. It's the big thing going right now. And if you look, it's going to have a little help going into its release date, which we actually got a release date at the end of the, um, as opposed to the other. You noticed that. Absolutely. December 7th, I believe, 2021. 
a couple Whereas, months after Back for Blood. Yes. And so just, zombies are going to be really moving around then. And I'm excited for Back for Blood. If people aren't Absolutely. aware of that, that's from many of the makers of the Left for Dead series. And if you've listened to this show at any length, you know my love for the Left for Dead series, especially Left for Dead 2. So I'm excited for that. But yes, you'll see zombies again being a part of our gaming culture here at the latter end of this year. So I'm looking forward to getting a chance to play with each. I agree with you. I think that Dying Light 2 Stay Human showed off better in its seven minutes and well, actually, essentially half the time than what was given for Horizon Forbidden West. Horizon Forbidden West was okay, but it seemed like more of the same. Whereas Dying Light 2, which had been in development now for eons, seemingly, since it was first announced, is something that looks like it's gone up by leaps and bounds over its predecessor. And I think that's probably what is is coming out to me most, is that when you look at both, both are sequels, but the Dying Light 2 Stay Human looks to me like a more brave determination to go ahead and say you know what we're going to make a lot of changes whether or not they work or not we're going to wait and see but we're going to make a lot more things that we can provide in the game that we're not there much more so than horizon forbidden west yeah i feel like dying light stepping out of the shadow of dying light it's stepping out of the shadow of itself yeah and going here i am again absolutely and i so. i'm saying that knowing the trailer i saw back at e3 2019 yep Yep. And it's a huge leap and bound from then. Yeah, I agree. Huge. And I'm I'm looking forward to both, but I am looking forward to Dying Light 2 Stay Human a little bit more than Horizon Forbidden West. I'm as of now, you a question, though. Sure. So you saw the trailers as well. Mm-hmm. What do you think is going to really happen if you don't stay human? Uh, because, yes, at the very end, you get infected and you start feeling some type of effects, but they conveniently faded to black before you find out what's going on. So could you go ahead and roam around as a zombie? We'll wait and see. That would be a cool thing, not something that's regularly done. So we'll see what happens with Dying Light 2, Stay Human, and also Horizon Forbidden West. Are they both later this year? We know one for sure in Dying Light 2. We don't know for sure with Horizon Forbidden West, so maybe we'll find more out on that at E3. If you got a chance to check out both of those gameplay trailers, which one was the best? Horizon Forbidden West or Dying Light 2 Stay Human? Please share us your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Well, my friend, it's been a great episode. I wanted to make sure everybody knows for the Monday show, Josh Sherino, I think, hopefully, is going to be back. I know he's been busy with some family stuff, but he should be back for Monday's episode. Wanted to go ahead and make sure and let everybody know we will give a recap of what went on at the box office for the first time in a long time. I'm really happy and stoked about that. Plus, also as well, we're going to share thoughts and do a deep dive on the Eternals. Because if you're not familiar with the Eternals, we're going to try and catch you up to speed with some of the Eternals, their abilities, their powers, and things like that coming up on the Monday show as well. But before we head on out, my friend, I turn it over to you. Could it be the Eternals or anything else? But any last thoughts on the way out? Let me leave you with some thoughts. Considering you're talking about Eternals coming up and everything like that, I actually did have some thoughts. So I'm sure you've all watched the trailers. Think about the decloaking when the ship comes in. The decloaking is bleeding from the gold symbols. And if you pay attention to everyone's magic, they bear a striking resemblance to those gold symbols. Also gave off a Planet of the Apes vibe. The monolith. I'm sure you're familiar with that. That same kind of vibe. We also want to wonder, something up with Atlantis? Did it come up from the water? Are we implying something there? You've got the song, Skeeter Davis, End of the World. Also, the trailer implies a love story there with Icarus. Oh, there's a triangle, love triangle. Oh, big time. Yep. Big time. Gemma Chan falling in love with two members of Game of Thrones who said they would see each other again when they're dressed in black. Mm. Funny how exactly. that works out. They didn't know it would be for Marvel. <laughs> is this going off the Neil Gorman run? I don't know if you're familiar with that comic book run, but that was the whole memory erased run. Mm-hmm. So it could be going there. And I like the fact that they bring up Cap a lot. And if you look, there's about Iron two Man. or three different times that you'll see Cap's shield. They also mentioned at the very end, Icarus mentions that he might want to leave the Avengers. So we'll see how that works out. Right. Because everybody laughed at him, but you know. 
Yeah, exactly. But we'll see what happens when Josh and I talk more of the Eternals. We'll get you up to speed on that, plus a lot more this Monday at the Pop Culture Cosmos. So for Jamie Monroy, this is Gerald Glassford. It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the PCC multiverse. We thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself a great